just never knew how to tell you. I would tell be able to what? talk about my Can life. You what I, I ever loved a lot. I have a two arms. You want me to say it out loud? We have some new neighbors on the block, and um, uh, by our standards, the standards of the block, they're a little bit different. They run around all day long in little tiny bikinis, and the men wear little bikinis, and now the whole block is talking about it, but they're very charming. So they wanted to know what house I lived in. So I said, would you like to come in and see it? Yes. Order in, oh, very impressed, blah, blah. Says to me, um, you will live here with a family? I said, no, it's just my husband and myself. You have children? Yes. I said, there's my, there's my son. Um, that's his picture on the piano. So she picks it up and then she sees Michael. So she says, and who's this? And I said, what am I really going to say? I said, that's his um, companion. So uh, she looked at me. So I said to her, my son is gay. Oh God, if I only had had a camera or that I could have taken this and we could have shown it, you know. And so she looks at me and she starts to cry. And she's crying and crying. And I said to her, what's the matter with you? My son is gay, not yours. Um, so she said, Oh, you're the bravest lady I ever met in my whole life. I said, I am? So she says, yeah, you're the first person who ever said that out right that they had a, a gay, you know. I said, let me ask you something. Do you know any gay people? She says, no. I said, come inside. We'll talk. I know all parents assume, because I've talked to them, that if there was a choice, everyone would be heterosexual. Oh, yeah. Wait, who? Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. Like, some people do have a choice. choice. Yeah. And they choose I, asexual. I hear the parents in PFLAG say, I accept my child, of course I would rather he be straight. That's their preference. Because, because, they're they're because they don't have an easier life, is that usually what they preference If we had a choice, it would be nice to be queer and be able to be as normal or unhassled as right. straight people. Right. That would be my right. choice, because right. I don't want to be straight. Right. Well, I think it's important to say that, because I don't think many people believe that. Cause so I the thought, message is, yeah. there's nothing wrong with it. Right. right. I like it. And I thought about all the years that I wasted with you worrying whether you were gay because I started worrying when you were small and and what a waste that was um, because I was wrapped in that fault I didn't provide you with whatever you needed in order to become heterosexual so that was my fault you know and it, and it well, it, thank you. Huh? I'd rather not be heterosexual. Well, well you know? the thing it's is, not something I, I feel mean, like I'm missing out on. No, but that 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 was, you know, that's what yeah. I was until I started getting involved with my own education. When I suspected that um Carlos was gay, that he was going to be gay, was when he was a young kid. Um, he lived with my mother and she spoiled him. He used to play with her clothes and he, I, he was about maybe six, seven years old. I, I, I always used to tell an aunt, an aunt of mine that I know he's going, I know he's going to be gay, I know it. And I used to laugh. Uh, when Bobby was growing up, uh I knew he was really different from Eddie as far as, if you want to stereotype boys. Bobby was uh, more into the, what, I, what I termed the, the quiet, gentle things. He liked to read and color and um, 
he did like to play with joy, his sister's toys. And he, he liked to play with trucks and things, but he wasn't like that. He was into war games, you know, and uh, guns and whatnot. And uh, my mother would often uh, comment that, you know, if you don't, you know, do something with Bobby, he's going to be a sissy. I always try to put him in, 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 to play baseball or football, and, and he never wanted to. He always wanted to write. I always felt like, like he was brilliant, and uh, he was always reading, and I liked that about him. But again, I knew inside for a long time that, that, that's, that he was gay, that he was gay. And in, 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 my, in my family, it, it, that's unacceptable. You know, that's, that's taboo. And, and I didn't want my son to be gay. For the most part, for a boy to be sissy was just really intimidating. And I didn't know there was any other word to describe the way I saw Bobby. Um, I just knew that society uh, didn't accept sissy boys who were sissy or other kids, you know, would make fun of him. All along when he was growing up, you know, uh, my wife wrote and I used to wonder why Craig never dated. Uh, he had one date in his whole life. Uh, Craig was always able to satisfy my curiosity by saying that, you know, Dad, I'm not just a kid that just wanted to uh, date someone and then uh, fulfill my sexual need. You know, I'm looking for a relationship. You know me, I'm a very uh, caring person. I said, well, uh, it's not easy to find someone that you can relate to at that age. So his excuse seemed to satisfy me very, very nicely. I asked Tucker, how old was he when he knew that he was gay? He said, well, I knew by seven, eight, but I was sure at age 13. And I said, Tucker, why didn't you tell us? And he said, well, for 99%, I knew you would accept me. But I was that 1% that I didn't know. And I couldn't risk that because home was my only safe place. When was the first time you were with a man? Or a boy? This is the kind of stuff I don't like. Okay. I don't like that kind of stuff, still. Okay. Okay, just tell me if you don't like, because this is really, right. this is, I mean, just, how old are you? Oh, six or seven, I guess. Six or seven years old? Mm -hmm. Not with a man. Hmm? Not with a man. You said man, not with a man. No. With another boy? Yeah. We talked about this. No. Before. Yes. We absolutely did. not. I know that you had been with with Lisa because I remember um, going with Lisa actually. You know, when we were I don't know how old with her mother's boyfriend of the time or whatever. I don't know how. We must have been pretty young. She they weren't living on on our street anymore. Not so. on Command Street. Not on Command Street yeah. anymore. You know, I remember when we went to the YMCA and stuff and. And me and him went and changed in the men's locker room, and I just remember being around naked men and just being like, whoa, you know, this is a trip. This is, you know, it was sort of exciting, but it was sort of weird. I didn't really, I felt, you know, it brought stuff up. I can't remember what, you know. It was a long time ago, but it definitely brought stuff up. So, you know, it was something going on back then. But again, I don't really sense it as that different than any kind of things that any child would be going through. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Craig was very concerned because we were very close. He was well aware of the high expectation I have of him. And he also was very reluctant to do anything that will disappoint me. And this, he suspected, it may disappoint me very much. So uh, for, for about a year or so, he comes home from college, and he would hint around. He would trying to trying to get me to raise the question about his sexuality, and it's too scary of a subject for me to deal with. I I would just push it aside. I would talk about something else other than what he wanted me to talk about. My parents never ask about anyone in my life. They um. It's it's one of those not so things. <coughs> at Valentine or right after Valentine's Day they, oh, yes, they visited me and oh, um, <laughs> there were some flowers on the table that Ellen had given me and um, my dad saw the, flo the the roses and um, he said uh, he asked me oh wow nice nice flowers where'd you get them I said oh I got them for Valentine's Day mm -hmm. and then he said so what are you going to be studying next semester. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, and when I came out to my mom and some of my friends, what I did is I said, you have, I match everyone, so I don't care who you tell. It is your prerogative to tell who you want to tell. Which basically means now the ball's in their court and they're the ones who are in the closet because they have to decide who they can trust to tell and who they can't trust to tell. And all of a sudden they know what it's like to have to decide, you know, who to tell this to, how to trust people, what to listen for in people, to know whether you can to know whether you can trust them or not. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden they're in the closet. All my concern was about myself. I felt so ashamed. I felt so guilty. I come from a conservative family. I thought, how can I tell them? Our village was very conservative. How could I, how I, could I come out? I really felt ashamed and I felt guilty. I thought there's something I have done. The first time that I admitted in a group that my son was gay, I, I mean, that was like the hardest thing I had to do because I was like embarrassed, you know, because Spanish people, you know, that's, that's they, they don't talk about stuff like that. Especially the men, it's like, they're too macho. There's a lot of gay people, I mean, Spanish men that are gay, and they're in the closet, and they act all macho, but <laughs> believe me, I know. <laughs> but um, I was afraid because in our culture, that, that, that doesn't go. In my lifetime, I'd never heard the word gay, homosexual, uh, lesbian. It was not in our terminology. We didn't use it in our church. We didn't use it in our home. I had just never heard, and I didn't know of anyone who was gay to my knowledge. I, I, I'd never met anybody. If I had, I didn't know it because I wasn't familiar with the lifestyle. I wasn't familiar with anything. And in my church, uh, in the Baptist church, I was never, it, it was just never brought up. It was brought up in the sense that it was a sin. We're Chinese, and Chinese, when it comes to dealing with matter like this, they tend to go into perpetual denial, meaning that, so you're gay, don't tell me about it. <laughs> when Ellen was very young, um, I wasn't a very good mother. And um, I was so demanding and a perfectionist and I just didn't have patience for a child. And Ellen and I <laughs> were at loggerheads a lot of time and it was only her dad who sort of the calm, quiet guy between us that kept uh, things going. The and, Berlin Wall. <laughs> yeah, he was, and and when we knew he was dying, we were both very frightened because we were going to be left alone with each other, and it it, it scared both of us. Hmm. And um, fortunately, we got really close, uh, mainly because I think I grew up. <laughs> and, well, I uh, certainly hadn't. Yeah. Well, you were still a kid. I had no excuse. And then. We got close enough that Ellen felt that she could tell me. Um, Except he, I didn't tell you. Well, you didn't exactly tell me, but you tried so many ways. Well, yeah, but I mean, even when, when I actually tried to actually come out and say, Mom, I'm gay, I completely chickened out. I mean, I was going to tell her. I remember the night as I was going to tell her, and we had been talking about the subject of homosexuality, very objectively, of course, having nothing to do with me. And uh, at the last minute, I decided, well, forget it, I'm not going to tell her anything. And she asked me that night if I was gay, and I was so shocked that she would just come out and ask. Most parents don't want to know, so they're certainly not going to ask. And even if their child is trying to tell them, they just shut it out. They say, no, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore everything you say, and it's not going to mean anything. And she just came right in out and asked, and I, of course, said yes, because I was too shocked to lie. And and I said the famous parent word, <laughs> are you sure? And Tucker said, yes, he was sure. And then Dick said, are you, do you want to talk about it? And now looking back, I realized how two-faced society is. Because when our middle son, you know, said that he was going to get married, we never asked him, was he sure or did he want to talk about it? Anyway, Tucker then asked me, mom, what do you think? And I said, I know very little about homosexuality. I know one gay man in New York. He was a friend, a brother of a friend of mine. And I said, Tucker, do you resent me? And Tucker said, why do you ask that? And I said, well, I'm sure I'm the cause of, of this problem. 
And so both men started to laugh and said, you don't have all that power. Easy for them to say, not so easy for me to accept. I threw water in his face. <laughs> I threw water in his face and, and I said, get up right now. You got to tell me what's going on. I want to know, are you gay? Are you gay? And he was like in shock. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't lie. <laughs> Too early to lie. And he, he, he said, yeah, whatever. And, and I was, I, I thought about everything. I was, I was embarrassed. Um, uh, I loved the person he was. I tried to understand. Every time I raised a question about, when I probe into to how he could uh, be attracted to a person of the same sex, he would turn around and raise me a question that is directed at me being a heterosexual. He, he would say, how can you be interested in making love to a woman? I don't have an answer for that. I, I suppose I was conditioned by what we call the social norm, you know, that's the way you, that's the way you follow, the social norm. And all I can see is my son, uh, I know it didn't, wasn't by choice because why would he choose that when life is so more difficult of being a gay person? I grew up with the psychological theory saying to me that if at this age when the child is four and they go through this attract the boy goes through the attraction to the mother because they never explained about the girl but the boy goes through the attraction to the mother mm -hmm. and then if they're going to be healthy they will get over this attraction and be heterosexual if they don't get over the attraction mm -hmm. then they're scared to love women because it reminds them of their mother which is a no-no and mm -hmm. so therefore they turn to men because really they're afraid to love women because they didn't get up through the set of a You know, I'm just saying. No, I understand. I can just see the bullshit in that so clearly because that would mean that gay people would be really twisted. Exactly. And there are some very twisted gay people, but you know, that's ridiculous. Their parents are creating problems for them by trying to help them by sending them to a therapist or whatever. Because if the kid is at a therapist only because the parent is frightened or is whatever about the fact that they're gay and that's the only reason that they're there and there's nothing else being worked on that kid is having or that adult whoever is having something worked on that is not a problem and therefore it's going to make it a problem many parents are afraid of what the neighbors will think they're afraid of what the other part of the family will think they're afraid of what the community at large will think you have a gay child? Whatever happened in your life? It is not true. It, it, they are not the cause. They, they, they had nothing to do with it. And I tell them this when they tell me, you had nothing to do with your child being gay. And then some parents say to me, he made himself gay. He made him, she made herself a lesbian. I recall the story of the young girl that went away to college and the mother got on TV and said she went to this lesbian college and she became a lesbian. And I laughed. I said, if I could call in, I can't call in on it. I can't sit there half an hour to call in. The daughter was a lesbian before she left home. The mother just didn't know it. But where she, when she got there, she could be herself. He's a very compassionate person. He's smart, he's articulate, he's, he's gay. Does, him, does that make him less of a person? I think I raised a beautiful boy. My two other kids are equally sensitive. But because they're heterosexual, they're gonna have a much easier life. not fair. I became angry. I became angry at a society that would call our son, who was on the honor roll, who was full of humor, who was caring about other people, who was a loving person whom we respected and loved above all, that they would call that son a faggot, a queer, and whatever they call gay and lesbian people. Part of hurt the most is much of the insult is directed against them by the Christian community, by the religious 
fanatics. These people, on one hand, they preach about God is all love, and, and but the action indicate that that their God love conditionally. You know, if you're not the right sexuality, the right color, or the right whatever it may be, it is their viewpoint that God shouldn't love them. Or they, 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 won't, they won't admit that that's how they feel, but in reality, that's how they feel. I'm a Christian, and the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. And I think that the question, you know, the hypothetical question or hypothetical situation of my daughter coming home and saying she was gay, I mean, my initial reaction is, I don't think it would happen. Of course, I know that there are Christian families who do have homosexual children, um, but my initial reaction is that I'm planning to raise my child in such a way, um, giving her guidelines and values and standards that I don't think that it will be part of um, her um, thinking um, and that the family life that she'll be exposed to with a, a mother and a father uh, will be a very attractive one and um, I'm not sure actually what goes into a person's decision to be homosexual but there seems to, to my mind, it, it must be something that went wrong in the family life that they came from. My son was gay. He was going to be gay. He was gay from the time he came into the world. I just didn't know it until later. He was gay. God made him gay. I had nothing to do with it. I cannot change him. I cannot change the color of my skin. I can't change the color of my eyes. They came with me at birth. So how can I go into a person's body and change them or their minds and change them from being uh, a gay to what we perceive as normal? I cannot do that. I can't do it. With all the medication in the world, with all the psychiatrists in the world, you cannot change what is to be. Bobby explained to us that he'd felt this way ever since he could remember. And I said, well, Bobby, you dated girls in junior high. And he said, well, that's what I was supposed to do. And coming from his dad, his dad felt that Bobby would grow out of it, that he just needed to date more girls. And of course, coming from my perspective, there wasn't a doubt in my mind that God was going to heal Bobby because you cannot be a homosexual person and go to he heaven. I mean, it's, um, the person has to repent um, or they'll be tormented in hell for all eternity. Where do you draw the line? And we're drawing the line on the basis of what is in Scripture and largely what the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights were or are rooted in, which are Judeo-Christian principles. I think what we're talking about, what a society uh, has, you know, a right to do or even an obligation to do. I mean, what kind of behavior are we going to promote? And if if you consider a, a particular type of behavior destructive, not only to the individual but to the society as a whole, if it's contributing to the breakdown of the family, which a society is based on, then a society has an obligation to discourage that activity and encourage something else. And I just kept uh, praying that, that Bobby was going to turn from the gay lifestyle. And of course, Bobby just became, as I said, progressively more depressed and felt that there just wasn't a future for him. Uh, he was literally filled with self-hate. He felt he was a worthless human being that didn't deserve to live on this earth. And it worried him all the time that he was gonna go to hell. And then um, we received a call about, I was at work at that time. My daughter received a call here about 10.30 and my niece told Joy that uh, Something terrible had happened. We found out that Bobby had uh, jumped over a freeway overpass in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Bobby died instantly. Um, and of course, I couldn't figure out what had gone wrong. It's like everything literally had backfired. I couldn't figure it out. I attempted suicide once, 
and I took a whole lot of pills, and um, but it weren't enough. <laughs> and um, I told you, remember? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but now I'm, I'm doing great now. I'm a part of a million organizations. Gay, I'm a gay activist, I'm a HIV AIDS activist, I'm a civil rights activist. Bobby's suicide is actually the catalyst that really uh, started me on this journey, so to speak. It was about a year and a half after Bobby died that I really got the courage to go talk to someone about homosexuality. I had been dealing with it on my own and uh, I had come to the conclusion that there wasn't anything wrong with Bobby, um, that God could accept Bobby the way he was, in my own conscience. Not, I did not um, rely on the Bible anymore to validate my son. I was afraid more that, that he felt that we weren't going to accept him. Um, I prayed a lot on it. I spoke to a lot of people. Um, I have a lot of support. I have wonderful friends. And um, they helped me through, through the fears and the pain and the confusion. Um, I have a friend, um, Huang. He was gay, and he helped me to understand that, that they weren't different, that they had a heart, that they loved just as we did, you know, um, that, that it wasn't dirty. And he helped me to accept that, that it was okay for, for my son to be gay. I, one time, was perfectly satisfied just get to a point where I can accept my son and, and learn to live with that. It's, now I'm beyond that. I really feel that, that I have a duty and obligation. I, I don't want, I don't want my son to go through life the way he's treated by society. I, I want to be able to do whatever I can to help make it look better for him. I don't envision that I'm going to change society, but I'm going to do my best just to do what I can to bring on some changes. It's, it's quite a rude awakening. I think what I find so interesting about it all is that I've opened my eyes to a lot of things in the world. Um, when Bobby's alive, <clears throat> my beliefs form my reality, and now it's just the reverse. Reality forms my beliefs. I can see how uh, just about everything that's been worth having in this life, uh, we've had to literally fight for it. So in, um, it was September 73, we joined a group which was at that time called Parents of Gays. Through the parents, my guilt was replaced through common sense. I met macho fathers and quiet fathers. I met outspoken mothers and bossy mothers and quiet mothers. And I realized that there is no pattern to the kind of families that have gay or lesbian children. I felt all of a sudden I should shout it off the rooftops. Dick and Amy Ashworth have a gay son and they are a normal family. My grandson Mark and his gay parade, and when I joined hands uh, together with my daughter Vicky and uh, my son-in-law Harry and uh, my grandson Mark and his lover Woody, I was beaming proud as a peacock. And the 
for the audience was cheering and pointing to us. Look at that all together, large family. That parade must have lasted for about an hour and a half. And it's about the longest hour and a half of happiness that I can remember having. It just means everything because, you know, I mean, you're just marching and feeling all that love from the people on the sides and feeling it yourself. And you move to tears throughout the whole thing. If you march with your family, I think that's about one of the highest levels you can get to. That's everything. Did I ever tell you, you know, when Harry and I came to San Francisco for our first gay pride parade, and you came to the motel where we were staying and uh, said that you were going to be wearing a leather harness, and you asked me if I minded? I don't remember that, no. And I asked you to explain to me what leather meant, but because to me it had all these terrible connotations of violence and it reminded me of the Nazi era. And you explained to me that it didn't mean that to you, but it still felt uncomfortable with it. Yeah. And uh, that was the time when a lot of your friends were wearing these huge mohawks, purple and blue mohawks. And we all went out to dinner with about four or five of your friends to uh, the Italian section. And there, you know, Harry and I, typical mother and father, walking along with everybody in mohawks and leather. And I mean, just everybody was staring at us. As a parent, you don't want your children's and your children's friends' appearance to put off people who don't know you. Like you said, it, it makes people perceive me incorrectly, you know, as not the kind of person I might really be. But again, you know, I don't really have time for those people unless they want to sit down and talk and then it won't matter what I look like because then I'll open my mouth up and, you know, then I'll be the person that I am. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be better, that it wouldn't be easier, that it wouldn't be more effective in the movement for you know gay rights and, and acceptance and all that. I'm not saying it wouldn't be any of those things to dress down and acclimate to society more. But I have so much hatred for society's views on so many important issues that I don't have time to please them and it's not that it's a political statement for me to have the piercings and the tattoos and the leather stuff and all that, you know? Because I've done otherwise. I've dressed, you know, like this and not had all my piercings in and felt fine like that too and felt like I'm me. But the other part of me exists as well. If we're trying That's to get okay. people to accept it in mainstream society, how could you act that way but and get excited? We are, but, but see, they may not be. But you see, but you that see, may not be their agenda. But you see, I don't think that that is... See, that's always been the agenda of many civil rights groups, is to gain the acceptance of basically white, straight, middle America. Yeah. And I'm not sure that I care what might make middle, straight, middle class. Well, well that's important. the only way that you're no, going to no. get all those things that you want. But you see, if, if you, all, all you do is assimilate into society, and, 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 and when you're in public, you, you, you shed all of your culture, all of your everything. And I'm not saying that I, that I agree with, that I would do the things that you're talking, talking about. I'm not talking about white, straight, middle America. Yeah, but I'm, you are. You're saying that's yes, what you the are. parade is for. You're saying that, that the parade is to appeal to those people. And, and to, some and of the marchers well, don't agree with that. The parade is to appeal to the mass population. Okay. Wouldn't it be me if we all somehow managed to get complete unanimity, which of course kills this idea right away, but we all decided to show up to the gay parade in business suits? You know, I mean, what would the media do? They would be forced to show, you know, a quarter of a million people dressed in business suits who announce that they're homosexual. The media wouldn't like that. It would be very effective, boring. however. It would be boring, but it would be effective. Right. Well, would... But sometimes, Terry, in order to gain something, you have to camouflage certain feelings until you gain a certain part of what you're fighting for. Well, because you can't always meet everybody head on. On the other hand, if it wasn't for people like that, and it wasn't for we Act be Up no place. and so on, right. we wouldn't be any place. So, oh, the hell with it. I'm caught up in the middle. I don't know what. Very much. What do we want? You're free. When do we want it? In 1981, I read just a very little statement about AIDS in the newspaper. And it said there was an illness that was discovered in California. It affected mostly gay men. And I rushed to the phone and I called Tucker. 
I said, Tucker, I'm reading just this little bit in the newspaper, and it talks about an illness that affects gay people. I said, Tucker, I feel this will become a major plague because unlike Legionnaire's disease, nobody will care because you're in a minority. And I must say, I lived with that fear and I didn't want to talk about it to anybody. I get so scared. I mean, I, I haven't shared a lot of what I was going through when you were in the hospital. I mean, I had to call friends over to sit with yeah, me in the morning, you know, to just because I was just going over the edge and I'd send Harry to be with you for a couple hours um, so that I could try to get myself together to, to be able to come and, you know, while we were waiting for HIV results to come back. I have a hard time imagining what if the test results did come back positive. You know, part of me thinks you would do a better job once, if I was to be positive, than you would not knowing. Because you would kick in, you would kick in with your, you know, instincts as a mother and as a friend and as, a, you know, just a supportive person. I think you would. You know, I don't ever want to have to find out. My son died of AIDS about three years ago. Uh, in my wildest dreams, I did not know my son had AIDS. In fact, I didn't know anything about AIDS. I always said to him, Joe, you have to eat because of his thinness. Then I noticed a change in his attitude and his, his voice. There was a sadness to his voice. And there seemed to be an urgency about what he was doing. And Tucker came in the house and I realized that Tucker had lost a lot of weight. And I realized also his voice didn't sound right. And I realized that Tucker would get AIDS. And I cried so hard and I, I cried for a month, but never letting Tucker know. And what I only want to say about AIDS is, it has two sides. As a nurse, it is, it is the most devastating, cruel illness. But the other side I've learned through Tucker and through the gay and lesbian community, the other side is love. I don't want my son to have died in vain. So I will take up the torch. I will find the strength and the en energy within me to tell other parents, especially the African-American parents, you have a gem on your hands. Worship this gem. Take care of this gem. Pro gem. Provide for it and raise it and nurture it. And someday this gem will be worth a million dollars to you in love and in sincerity, in his gifts to the world, a painter, a writer, a sculpture. This is a gem you have. Mold it beautifully and love it. And now I will go anywhere, say to anybody, I love my gay son. I did for my gay son. Even in, even in his death, I am going to let the world know being gay is good. I almost take an inordinate pride in, in my child being gay because um, I know it has made us very close and I know it's part of being her. She wouldn't be the person she is and I think she's a pretty great person if, you know, that's part of her, that she is in fact a gay person. And um, I, I wouldn't change it. I would never want it changed. Um, I don't think I ever even thought about that. I mean, you know, the, you know, what I, you know, I don't think that even entered my head. It's yeah, well, no, I mean, you don't even realize how special that is. I mean, you really don't. You, you just think, well, you know, you're my child. Of course, I love you no matter what you do and how crazy you drive me. And I mean, that's, you don't realize that, I mean, he said unconditional love that you, you know, that you're capable. I guess you're capable. Parents are capable of unconditional love, but I find a lot of parents don't. Their love does come with conditions. You will be the way that we expect you to be, that we want you to be. And the fact that you don't, and you like me, <laughs> love me, exactly the way I am, is amazing to most of my friends. It seems like you remove all barriers once you come to accept that. All, all things are possible in terms of interpersonal relationship. 
but it could drive you away. It could cause a human being to inflict so much pain, as I've seen going to the peace flag. So many parents reject their children. Their own flesh and blood, they reject them. I, I cannot comprehend that. I get angry when I think about that. It's sad. It's sad that there are people out there that throw away their, throw away their kids. They literally throw them away because they're not what they expected them to be. I mean, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that it didn't happen to me. I think that's when, when, I, when, we, when I found out, we became real good friends. That's where our life just turned around because we didn't have no, no communication. We didn't have a relationship until he told me this. And all of a sudden, like, when, I mean, it was hard and I worked on it um, and got all this help and I went through all these feelings, but I was willing to go through the feelings so that I couldn't get to a point that, that, I, that it would be past me, that I, I couldn't have a relationship with him. And that's what helped us. You know, I'm so grateful that you came out the closet. You know, that I didn't have to find out when you was 30 or 35 years old dying from the virus. I'm grateful that you came out and that we became friends and that I would, I'm able to, to just love you. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wasn't cheated from that, you know, from, being, from having a relationship with you. I feel since I found out, we, I mean, we talk about everything. Don and Craig comes home every other week with all his dirty laundry and we would, mom would whip up a good exotic dinner and we would go out and eat, and Don is just like another son to me. Very sensitive kid, very bright. They have a lot of idiosyncrasies and all that, but they're working them out, you know, just like any relationship. So instead of having a daughter-in-law, I have a son-in-law. I feel gifted, or uh, it's like lucky, mm -hmm. or whatever, that we can accept what our children, what pleasures our children can yes. give us. Yeah. We're able to accept it. It's, That's all it is, is to accept it. It's not a matter of your gift. It's, it's there for everybody. Gift. All you have to do is say, yeah. So do you think the majority of your parents, Jim, who are gay children, need accept their children? I, I haven't got the slightest idea. I don't know. I don't know the, the majority of parents who have gay children. I don't and, and I kind of suspect that probably, probably a great many more would if they knew their children were gay. Probably a great many of them don't know their children are gay because the children are afraid to come out to them because they're afraid to be rejected. We hear that at the table all day long during the parade. But you know what I hear that remark. What I think the oh, I wish my parents were like you. How could I tell my parents? In other words, you have to go overcome your whole background, overcome all the prejudices that surround you to look for that. It's difficult. I mean, to me, it's about love. It's about just looking at the person. You know, not, not what they are, what, I don't know. I love you. You can be anybody that you want to be. You can love whomever you will. You can travel any country where your heart leads. And no, I will love. You can live by yourself, you can gather friends around, you can choose one special one. And the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're some girls grow up strong and bold Some boys are quiet and kind Some race on ahead, some follow behind Some grow in their own space and time Some women love women and some men love men some raise children and some never do. You 
You can dream of a day never reaching the end of everything possible for you. Don't be rattled by names, by taunts or games, but seek out spirits true. If you give your friends the best part of yourself, they will give the same back to you. You can be anybody that you want to be. You can love whomever you will. You can travel any country where you It's a celebration of the children that we love who are worthy and good and beautiful and should be appreciated. This is like the high point of my year having her with me. It's just like such a good feeling. I'm very proud of her. That's the ultimate. When you have your parents love you for who you are, it's the best. I wish that my parents would march in the parade. It's so natural to love your children and for them not to have that love makes me want to fight hard. This year is a uh, difficult one for me personally because my two sons died last year and uh, they died from AIDS and we're, that's why we keep this on and hope that uh, we soon won't have to worry about uh, that anymore. We have cleared off the table, the leftovers saved, washed the dishes and put them away. I have told you a story and tucked you in tight at the end of your knockabout day. As the moon sets its sail to carry you to sleep, over the midnight sea Well, I will sing you a song No one sang to me May it keep you good company You can be anybody You can love whomever you will You can travel any country where your heart leads And know I will 